morning we have been talking about classic Hollywood period, remember? So, if my question remains that what is classic Hollywood period and what are the major features of that period, what will be your answer be? What is the features of classic Hollywood? Talk about the studio system, yeah. uh, major studios, yeah. and also the beginning of stardom. How you had all these uh, stars, uh, Clark Gable and uh, James Dean, and which, who, who came later on. But primarily, you talk about the studio system, and then later the stars. Star on. system and how stars would be under contract with major studios. Remember that? Okay. So, uh, where do stars figure during the fifties? Uh, when we talk about the 30s and the 40s and also early part of the 50s, then stars were a huge draw. The uh, position of directors as a major box office uh, magnet, that took place only during the uh, later part of the 60s and the early 70s, the director's decade. That is what we call the new Hollywood period, okay. but 50s saw an upsurge uh, in the in making of a different kind of a hero. Okay. So, what were the 40s and 50s heroes all about? If we say that the hero in the 50s was a different kind of a hero, still stardom mattered a lot, still stars were under contract with the studios, but the studio hold was slackening by this time. And who were these heroes now? So, if we want to think about the heroes of the 50s, then we have to look at the heroes of the 40s and 50s also in, and even before. So, uh, there was a huge box, uh, box office star during the uh, silent period called Rudolph Valentino. Are you aware of Rudolph Valentino? Are you? No. Take down the name. See, you are doing a course like this, you ought to know Hollywood history, motion picture history and only then you can understand any other cinema. Sandeep, who was Rudolph Valentino? Silent. Superstar of the silent period. Can you recall any movie? The Sheik, okay, where he plays an abandoned white boy who is raised by the Arabs. So, the sheikh was a major, major blockbuster of Rudolph Valentino. And uh, he was of a mixed race, extremely handsome, but uh, however the fact remains that he was the first male superstar. And uh, basically he was known for his looks rather than his histrionics. Yeah. So, uh, those classic Greek god looks and silent stars, so na naturally he did not have to speak any lines. He had a strong accent, he was his dialogue delivery was not very good and uh, mm, uh, 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 there was nothing except you know his classic good looks, there was nothing much to recommend him, but still one of the earlier great stars of the period of, uh, Holly of Hollywood and therefore, mm, his name figures in the greatest stars or greatest uh, you know in pantheon of Hollywood stardom. Um, there, there was a like mass hysteria when Rudolph Valentino prematurely died, he was not well and he died, he was in his early thirties and fans just broke down and there was a massive hysteria uh, in outside his house and people just went berserk. because a huge star died and uh, that went on to create uh, something called you know a coinage of the term called fandom. So, now fandom is a very common word, very commonly used word. We in Tamil Nadu, we have great act stars, actors who have these fan clubs. Okay. So, we call them fandoms where stars and their images, they are bathed in milk and what not, yeah, they, are, they are weighed in gold etcetera. Women even try to you know commit suicide 
when a major star dies, that kind of you know thing. But uh, historically, Valentino is one of the most uh, uh, well known and the first documented star to have generated that kind of hysteria. Okay. After that, of course, we had major actors, uh, stars, Clark Gable, James Stewart, Cary Grant, who had enormous fan following, especially among ladies. Even men wanted to be like Cary Grant. Cary Grant's own sexuality is suspect. He was a known bisexual. Now, it is all out in the open, okay, but he nevertheless married six times and uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, we were talking about the other day how to, uh, you know making of a Hollywood star Elizabeth Taylor and also many of these uh, link ups and romances and marriages would be like a stu studio manufactured devices just to keep the fans happy and men and women alike should worship him that was the idea. Now, the hero in the 50s, so that th those were the 40s or in the 50s. Can you remember any other major stars of the period? Stars, actors. 50s are symbolized majorly by uh, two of our greatest method actors, James Dean as well as Marlon Brando. Both come from New York school rather than LA. So, they were not like manufactured stars, but they were trained actors. Elvis Presley, another 50s phenomenon, not a star uh, in sense of movie star, but a huge, huge uh, star in terms of fan following. The Beatles as well. So, you have the Beatles uh, close on the heels of the Presley phenomenon. And if you uh, watch a movie called A Hard Day's Night, have you heard of? Heard of, yeah. We uh, will be doing excerpt from that movie soon. Okay. So, please uh, make a note of it. Beatles, Hard Day's Night and Help. They starred in two movies, beautiful movies okay. and movies which are still very fresh, still uh, very young in approach. So, Elvis, James Dean and Marilyn Brando, hero in the 50s. Now, I will give you one minute exercise to just think over who were the major stars preceding Brando and Dean. Think about it. Major Hollywood stars preceding Elvis, uh, sorry, uh, Elvis Presley of course, but he was not uh, an actor per se. James Dean and Marilyn Brando, great actors, phenomenal stars, but who were there before them? Think all your favorite movies, think of the actors starring. We are, we are still on heroes and not heroines. Bogart. Humphrey Bogart. Good. Humphrey Bogart. Cary Grant. Cary Grant. Yeah. Henry Fonda. Henry Fonda. Clift. Yes. Mont Monticlift. Monticlift. Again, a New York product, New York uh, acting school product. Yes. Trained by the legendary Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler. They were the proponents or exponents of method acting in New York. Montecliffe, James Dean, Brando, but uh, Montecliffe never generated hysteria, Brando and Dean did, that is the difference. So, we agree uh, Humphrey Bogart, Cary Grant, Clark Gable, There was a, a great star during the uh, uh, um, uh, 30s and the 40s who would uh, uh, invariably star in all these gangster films. Do you remember his name? He was another major box office draw. James Cagney, not James Stewart. James Stewart was a favorite of who? Hitchcock, yes, and also Frank Capra. But then a Hitchcock movie is a Hitchcock movie, the director before above the title is that kind of star. You know, so, Howard Hawks and Hitchcock were two 
uh, act directors of the classic period whose names appeared above the title, the name above the title. Remember, whose autobiography? Good, Frank Capra's. So, hero in the 50s. So, we will see how there has been a marked shift from the heroes of the 30s, 40s and the early 50s and till Brando and Dean and what brought about those changes, what were those socio cultural changes and the difference in acting style and major in and major trends in film making. So, Brando Dean and Elvis to an extent changed the way young men could be seen in popular culture. So, they were not the hyper masculine actors, the projected hyper masculinity as was evident in Clark Gable in James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart. They were uh, more in touch with the feminine aspect of their personality, not effeminate definitely, but more sensitive, more brooding, gave an aura of introspection and often appeared uh, confused and ambiguity, ambiguous about many things including their sexual orientation. And this is a feature which is very common in Monty Clift also. So, the word uh, the term that is uh, coined for them is protest masculinity, protesting against the established norms of hyper masculinity. So, therefore, they mark a shift from those hyper masculine stars to this. Now, see in the we saw the phenomenon again. Uh, reoccurring during the 80s. Now, see 70s was, was again all about the method acting. Remember Pacino, Hoffman, Nicholson, De Niro, who else? Harvey Keitel. So, these were the uh, New York trained um, actors uh, new, new, trained in the method acting style. And then cinema was dominated by the directors who are collectively known as the movie brats, hmm? movie brats, Scorsese, uh, Paul Schrader, even Lucas and Spielberg. Yeah, the movie brats. So that was the that uh, that was those were the 70s. Of course, Spielberg is still survives, but 80s saw again a shift. Now look at you watch these method actors in the 70s. Pacino in Dog Day Afternoon, confused about his sexuality. He is married, he, he, he has fathered children, he still wants to give up his family and be with a man, right. You remember the movie Dog Day Afternoon, De Niro in Taxi Driver, disillusioned with war and therefore, all his problems, all his confusions basically emanate from the factor that he is disillusioned with the society around him. Okay. So, working class man protesting against the established socio political system in America. So, there was a protest. Okay. Jack Nicholson, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, Harvey Keitel, Mean Streets, hmm? and a couple of other movies as well. All these trained in method acting. But what happens in the 80s? Who were the heroes? Who were the superstars of the 80s? Stellon, Schwarzenegger and Stellon. Okay, and also to an extent Bruce Willis. To an ex extent, um, what's his name? Seagal. Steve Seagal. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, those were the actors who marked the 80s. So there has always been a cycle. Hyper masculinity followed by a cycle of sensitive actors, etcetera. And now, what do we see? 90s onwards. Think of all our major actors, are they hyper masculine type? No, they do not embody that kind of masculinity as was uh, illustrated by the Schwarzeneggers and Stellons. So, you watch Fight Club, okay, it is a very different kind of a hero or heroism or machoism you are talking about, there will be blood. It is a subversion of hyper masculinity and patriarchy. Hmm? Uh, any, anything else? 
uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's Punch Drunk Love, Magnolia, Tom Cruise in Magnolia, again interrogating the constructs of hypermasculinity. So, this is a feature. So, if you think every era defines certain kind of movies. Same actors also have hypermasculinity. But it's still very confused. Okay, not confused about his identity, but uh, uh, a man who is not an out-and-out anti-hero. He is anti-hero, but is still not in the same vein as the Bruce Willis. And he, he is not taking on the establishment. Yeah, one, it's not a one-man army against this enemy. And for Bruce Willis, Schwarzenegger. Stallone, the army is very clear, the enemy is very clear, right? Hmm. Very clearly defined, us and them. So, they also embodied a particular political ideology in America. Now, we do not have, there is lot of ambiguity. In all Paul Thomas Anderson movies, you have that theme. In all David Fincher movies, there is that theme, the recurring theme, the enemy lies within. So, James Dean 19, we are going to analyze a phenomenon called James Dean and what brought about this phenomenon and then his legacy. So, James Dean 1931 to 55, some of you have, are already familiar with his two great movies, Rebel Without a Cause and East of Eden. Those of you are not, then please do watch them and third major movie is Giant, directed by George Stevens. Worked with three great, only three movies and three great directors, Nicholas Ray, we already discussed Nicholas Gray, uh, Ray, uh, George Stevens in Giant and Elia Kazan in East of Eden. So, I think we have tried to uh, cover all these three directors. Uh, Dean lost his mother at age 9 and he was estranged from his father. So, that was his background a small town boy and then thought acting would uh, be his uh, profession for life and shifted to New York, got trained in method school. He had this uh, shuffling, mumbling style and therefore, because of that he was often compared to the great Brando and was always called a mixed up kid. I think Elia Kazan was the first to name him so. And uh, the story goes that uh, when he was acting with the likes of stars, Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson, who had nothing to do with method acting, both of them in Giant, they could never follow what he is saying. They could never, they would never understand. El Elizabeth Taylor, of course, had some ex experience, some brush with method acting because she had acted in um, a place in the sun with Monty Cliff. So, she knew what method acting is all about. But uh, Rock Hudson and other people in that uh, crew had no idea of what method acting is all about and they were very um, uncomfortable with um, uh, having James Dean around. His characters are often inarticulate. What do you understand by inarticulacy? Not thus not being able to express but also extremely confused about what they want to express. Okay. This is a theme that uh, uh, runs through the works of Daniel Day Lewis also, okay. inarticulacy. Yes. People, uh, you know, characters who are not able to come to terms with what they want to say. Okay. So, most of his characters, they are angst ridden protagonists, almost like a precursor to the great method actors of the 70s, misunderstood outcasts and in all his three movies, he is desperately craving approval from a father figure, just three movies, but already. So, um, there is a theme there running through the, there is a thread run, that runs throughout his body of work. So, at Elia Kazan directed East of Eden, as we have already talked about it, Rebel Without a Cause and Giant, just three movies, jo Giant is by George Stevens. So, uh, East of Eden based on John Steenbeck's novel is set in rural California and was released after Dean's death. 
part of the movies, the movie that we we see, we get to see is based on uh, the book of Genesis and the uh, Kazan was basically concerned with the father son and the brother, the conflict between the two brothers, so the Cain and Abel section. That was another theme, another motif in Kazan's body of work also, father conflict between fathers and sons. So, remember therefore, he directed, he collaborated with Arthur Miller so well, death of a salesman, all my sons, again the same story. Giant 1956 is based on a novel by Edna Ferber, a monumental meandering novel based in Texas, where Rock Hudson plays a rancher who owns some 50,000 50, acres of land and James Dean is a, a worker there, a farm hand and who falls in love with Rock Hudson, his master's wife as played by the beautiful Elizabeth Taylor. And Dean's character, he strikes oil, yeah, we are told that during the, have you watched the movie Giant? Do watch it, do watch it, I am sure it is available uh, uh, online somewhere and you, if you do watch it, it's a, it's a great study in a particular period in American history. So, um, he, we are told that uh, James Dean has been bequeathed a plot, you know a very small uh, part of the land by Rock Hudson's dead sister, who remains an, uh, 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 a spinster and Rock, uh, the James Dean character has served her very well. So, before dying she names a small section or plot of land uh, for him and he strikes oil and then becomes a billionaire richer than Rock Hudson. And then he ages 40 years and then you actually find all these actors aging on screen, although they were not old, they were not yet in their 40s and 50s, but they acted and it is a very well acted movie. Rebel Without a Cause, one of his most defining film, I mean if you look at his, the way he, he he is clothed in the movie. So, that started a trend, blue jeans, red jacket. So, uh, his famous dialogue, you are tearing me apart, who does he say this to? His father basically and you say one thing and he says another and everybody changes back again. So, a typical teen pick, that is what we call them today, but not, not a teen pick in the, uh, uh, along the lines of clueless. Also. Okay, it's a very serious kind of a teen pick, which gave vent to the angst of the teenagers those days. And the title says it all, rebel without a cause. They don't know against whom they are protesting. They feel they are being very cool when they protest. But it, it's uh, so. Uh, this is the background. Juvenile delinquent movies were extremely popular in that uh, era. There was a movie called The Blackboard Jungle where students protest against teachers, it's a very popular film and uh, rebel without a cause, yeah, takes its cues from the blackboard jungle. So, in, uh, in rebel, Dean stars as Jim Stark along with Natalie Wood and Sal Mineo, who was another method actor, Sal Mineo is the boy who plays, who dies. Yeah, the kid who dies in the movie. Okay. And Brando was initially considered for the role, but then he was uh, thought to be too old to play a teenager. And if you watch the movie, I, I just assume some of you have watched the movie and his performance does show distinctive influence of Brando. So, Rebel Without a Cause was coined in, uh, the term itself was coined in 1944, before the movie came out by a, a psychologist, sociologist called Robert Linder, who had written, uh, written a book nine, in 1946 and Warner Brothers had bought the right to the uh, book. And I am quoting something from the novel, from the book, sorry. The psychopath is a rebel, a religious disobeyer of prevailing codes and standards, a rebel without a cause an agitator without a slogan, a revolutionary without a program. So, that is what defines a rebel according to 
Robert Linder. So, who is a rebel? A re, uh, rebel is a milestone in the creating of new ideas about young people. The novel as well, the book as well as the movie basically deals with the concept of unfocused rage. These young people full of rage, but they do not know who the rage is against, whether it is the teachers or the authority figures, you know the lawmakers etcetera or their parents. Precedence in cinematic history is from Marlon Brando's role as a motorcycle gang leader. So, you know it was one of those today we call them bike flicks, right? And the biker flicks. So, by one of uh, Marlon Brando played the role in the wild one in 1953. You know, influence of Marlon Brando, they are like far reaching. You watch a movie like Gulam. Amir Khan's Gulam. Uh, which movie is it based on? He is asked, he is a boxer, he is asked to throw a game by his brother, and uh, the brother is in league with these uh, so called, you know, small time goons and thugs. So, which movie is it based on? And then the brother is killed, he is a peacemaker between various people, he is also a lawyer in the movie, right. And there is another activist who gets killed and then our hero that he turns into a rebel. So far he is a drifter, but then when he watches his brother die and when he watches his this activist die, then he turns into a revolutionary of sorts, a one man army against this army of uh, goons. Which movie is it based on? On the waterfront. So, but if you, uh, how many of you have watched Gulam? Amir Khan's Gulam, no? Do watch it and watch it back to back with On the Waterfront, also Rebel Without a Cause. Now, why are we talking about uh, Gulam at this point? Because in On the Waterfront, there is no biker uh, gang, but in Gulam, there is one. Do you remember? Okay, uh, uh, there is a group of bikers who always arrive on the scene whenever there is some problem and they are always on bikes, okay, so biker gang and they help uh, the hero out in one of his major moments of crisis. So, uh, that scene is a total lift from the wild one. Now, uh, also we had a phenomenon called Elvis Presley in 1950s and uh, along with Brando and Presley, Dean created a, a kind of role model that altered the way young men were perceived. The so called enemies, everyone who is in authority. There is a, a, a book called uh, A Generation of Vipers by Philip Wiley and uh, the, uh, the book coins a term called momism, mama's boys, no moms and momism. So, they want to rebel against the concept of momism because we have been like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, stripped of our ma masculinity by our mothers. So, momism, hand pecked father, bossy mother and that is something that you find in rebel without a cause as well. What can you do when you have to be a man? Jim asked his father at one point in the movie that because why, why are you so dominated by my mother? Okay, so, um, the cause, nothing really, he does not have any cause. Um, it is a story uh, which takes place uh, within 24 hours, okay, yeah, very tightly knit plot, knit plot structure and three teenagers from LA, all brimming with undirected rage. What is the other guy's problem? Sal Minio's. He is just brought up by a governess, parents are never at home. He is one of those very upper middle class kind of a boy and he lives in a very comfortable surroundings, but then when uh, you remember how the movie opens? Yeah. 
in a police officer's room. Okay, all these three have been uh, arrested for some reason or the other for thus causing some minor disturbance in the uh, neighborhood. And uh, James Dean, for James Dean, his parents come to bail him out. For the girl, her parents come, and then for the boy. For the other boy, no one comes except his governess. Okay, parents are separated or divorced, something like that. Very wealthy, but no affection. What is the girl's problem? We are talking about you know undirected rage. So what 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 ails the girl in the movie? Yes. Yeah, she wants. She is very affectionate towards her father, but he is in no mood to listen to her. Okay, and he says uh, after a certain age, girls have to be more reserved, more like ladylike. And she says, "Why?" Okay, so th th those kinds of issues, right? So um, rebellion against emasculation of the father, who lacks decisiveness and strength. And at one point, James Dean says, "She eats him alive, and he takes it." So again, you know, a kind of a protest masculinity. Man have to be assertive, but then this he is not a very assertive man. He is not the hyper masculine man, but he is identifying a certain problem that was uh, uh, identified with me, uh, by many people may, uh, before him that uh, um, women are slowly emasculating men in American society. On being a man, that's what he says uh, about his father. If he had guts to knock mom cold once, then maybe she would be happy and she would start picking on him. So, other issues were like juvenile delinquency and uh, also the conclusion is that grown ups also do not have solution to teenagers problems. James Dean phenomenon, we were talking about making of the James Dean phenomenon. So, just three movies and today he is immortal. Why? One was the style, okay, the way he was styled in the movie. See, he is not basically remembered for giant. Okay, in giant, he ages 40 years. By the end of the movie, you see him like a 50 year old or late 50s, something like that. East of Eden, yes, very respectable movie by the great Elia Kazan. So, Kazan got the major chunk of credit and also based on a classic American novel, but rebel made James Dean what he was okay. and his iconic red jacket, the hairstyle. Okay, we are talking about making of a star here and fast car, fast bikes, all these things you do not see in giant. The switch blade scene, if you watch the movie, please mark it, the switch blade scene where he is involved in a knife scene and the chicky run scene, remember chicky run scene where they challenge the rival gangs, you know that is let us run, let us race cars and whoever gets out fast or gets out before is a chicken, is a coward. That is the scene that was replicated in Gulam as well, it is not there in on the waterfront. Okay, so, Gulam is many movies and the cult world and the language, the jargon of the teenager. James Dean uh, died in his Porsche, which was called a little bastard. Rebel without a cause was released after his death and the chicky run scene prefigured his own tragic death, his love for fast living and fast cars. It is sad and it is very uh, eerily coincidental that uh, um, James Dean also participated in a road safety campaign, where he urged drivers not to drive rashly. Remember the next life you save could be mine, that was the slogan. Now who are fans? We are talking about fandom and James Dean. So who are fans? That is my question to you. Who are fan? Are you a fan of any actor? Yes, Kanti. Okay, Daniel Day Lewis is a major actor. He may not be a star. 
he may not be a huge phenomenalist star because see he never cultivated himself that way he didn't play the star game that's also one thing he could have done that but there are some people who deliberately stay away but then there are some people who play that image of heroism okay daniel de lewis never repeated himself never created an iconic image for himself same th- same can be said about benicio del toro okay he never played those games but then are, there are certain people who do these things okay so james dean perhaps we can't say that he, he played it up but uh, by default perhaps because of his uh, very premature death he has come to be uh, come to become uh, you know an all time role model a star okay so fans who are fans now here we see a picture where uh, an actor in chains they want to institutionalize you this is fan this is becoming this is like a part of fandom this is what fandom does to you institutionalize you how do you institutionalize someone we say right he is not an actor he is an institution by himself how do you get institutionalized i'm sure all of you know what are the practices what do people do what do fans do we have a great star actor shahrukh khan um and we see him always surrounded by fans okay fans and also uh, who plays up to their image the media fanzines popular magazines media nowadays you also have social network sites okay so these are the and twitter facebook and all those kinds of things so they, what do they do they institutionalize you ha huh? like some stars have like this celebrity followers cult. yes can you give me some example yeah uh, uh, does that is still exist they rebuilt it good okay mm, yeah i am sure that there are certain stars at least in our country who are institutionalized by religious tropes okay now uh, what does it mean to have to have your own fandom what is fandom fandom entails the meaning of being a fan a group of people coming together and institutionalizing someone some okay uh, fandom studies investigate how fans express their likes and dislikes and nowadays you have all kinds of things all kinds of medium to for fans all kinds of platforms for fans to express their likes and dislikes so uh, the moment a movie is released next day there must there would be like millions of posts about that actor about the movie because you have a fan following fans are following you literally nowadays on social media okay uh, fans discuss comment and write on films perhaps they are not qualified to do that but they do that because they are fans so they have every right to do so fans of course they can be manipulative and they can be manipulated as well by marketing forces can you give me some instance on how fans can be manipulated well every time there is a new movie coming coming up uh, uh, you just have to generate certain kind of a story about a star and then you look at the hysteria that follows among the fans and that leads to i am you uh, there are numerous examples and if you watch it very carefully you will find uh, anywhere uh, in the world and especially in our country whenever there is a major movie up for release there is always some kind of a controversy then because that generates interest that's the way media and stars manipulate fans fans will be there but then uh, it's another thing it's another art to manipulate the emotions that will of course result in more footfalls 
Sometimes fans can also influence and control the film as a product. Can you give me some example? There was this movie which was made in Kerala about 10 years back, mm -hmm. which is starring both Mohanlal and Mamuti and Joey Chawla. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, uh, she has to choose between either of them. They actually came out with two endings of the movie. In one she chooses uh, Mohanlal, the other one she chooses Mamuti. You cannot antagonize the fans. So. Yeah, so they screened yeah. it in different regions. So mm -hmm. depending on whoever had more fans over there. Uh, Maniratnam Dalpati is based on which epic? Mahabharata. Mahabharat. And uh, uh, which role is uh, Rajnikanth, superstar Rajnikanth, essaying? Karna's, right? And what happens to Karna in Mahabharat? Does he die in Dalpati? Yes? Does he die in Dalpati? No. No. No, no. 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 He doesn't. Okay, why? How can you show Rajnikan dying on screen? You see? So, some fans control the film as a product. So, uh, it does not matter to us what authenticity or being faithful to the epic. Fans control the way things are done. Uh, we were just talking about Kuli. Kuli's original screenplay had Bachchan dying at the end, but because he had just come out of near death experience. How many of you are not familiar with the Kuli accident? Uh, Mr. Bachchan almost died during a fight scene, during an action scene, during the shooting of the movie and he was hospitalized for many months following that accident and it was Sometimes the rumors would have it that he is already dead and uh, those we are talking about 1982 when we did not have all these ch media channels, etcetera, television channels and so many newspapers and magazines, but fans would throng the hospital throughout and uh, uh, some, some occasionally it, the rumor would be floating in the air that Mr. Bachchan is no longer alive, whatever, okay, but then he came out of it and the movie was eventually completed and it was released in 1983. The original screenplay had him dying at the end. Because he has come out of this uh, near death experience, the uh, director had to change the ending of the movie, because now you cannot show Bachchan dying on screen. And interestingly, uh, after Kuli, his, start, his career started going downhill because see, you have been deified to that extent. After that, anything, anything, whatever you do, cannot measure up to that level. And the other movies that followed were just not there. I mean, they just de didn't uh, capture the phenomenon. Okay, they were very mediocre products, etc. And now he has been deified to the extent uh, of being almost like God. He can even defeat death. So, uh, the only movie as far as I can remember which had Bachchan dying after the Kuli incident was Agnipath and it was a miserable flop. It was a flop for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons for its uh, flopping was that uh, people were not just not interested in seeing him as a hero one yeah, and also the fact that he dies on screen because people were no longer interested in watching him die. There was another lesser known movie called Main Azad Hu based on Frank Capra's Meet John Doe, uh, which again had him dying on screen and the movie was not even released properly. A Bachchan movie not finding a release. So, the legend continues. We have uh, numerous James Dean appreciation societies. Warner Brothers even made a movie, a short a documentary called The James Dean Story in 1957. There are several biographies and he is also a gay icon. His biographies, The Mutant King and James Dean, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. There is another biography called, just called James Dean and then Silver Screen Mavericks is the, and on the cover you can see James Dean. Malin Brando, Steve McQueen and Johnny Depp. He also represented cult of youth, eternally young, eternally alive 
and the only two deaths that can match up to his legendary death and the phenomenon that ensued. One is death of Rudolph Valentino, we were just talking about him, the silent movie star actor and then Marilyn Monroe and how these stars have been institutionalized. James Franco did a movie called James Dean, how closely he resembles him though. And then the legacy continues, you have, you have uh, John Travolta doing a James Dean in Greece and that is Matt Dillon. Any questions on making of a fan of phenomenon? So, these are the things that we have been talking about stars also occasionally in this course. We talked about method actor and now we talked about a great star and a phenomenon. Okay, so, thank you very much. We will be continuing tomorrow.